you are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guests today are Jeff and Melanie Carpenter, co-owners of Zach Woods Farm, a 30-acre certified organic medicinal herb farm and botanical sanctuary located in the Green Mountains of northern Vermont. Melanie and Jeff are also the co-authors of the new book, The Organic Medicinal Herb Farmer, the ultimate guide to producing high-quality herbs on a market scale. So welcome to Sustainable World Radio, Melanie and Jeff. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jill. Sackwood Farm sounds so beautiful and very productive. You grow over 50 species of herbs. Can you describe your farm to our listeners? Sure. Well, we, uh, we have 10 acres of land here on the home farm, and uh, it's, uh, it's far from what you would consider ideal agricultural land. It's, uh, it's gently sloping. Fortunately, it slopes off to the southwest, so we get some good solar exposure. Um, and the soils are fairly marginal, or were to start out with when we bought the farm. This land had previously been used to uh, grow potatoes and then was heavily grazed with with poor uh, conservation practices previously. So when we bought the land, um, we saw the potential, and it was affordable. So we have been uh, building the soil for the last 15 and a half years that we've owned the farm, and we've seen a tremendous improvement in the overall quality of the soil and the wildlife and the water quality surrounding us. So we feel good about our role in the community here. We also lease land from two neighbors. And in addition to our 10 acres here on the home farm, we have another 20 acres. We have generally between 10 and 15 acres in cultivation in a given season. Any um, surplus land that we have opened up is often in cover crops waiting for the next year's planting or in previous years. We're mainly row cropping medicinal herbs because we are a commercial herb farm. So we're, Melanie and I are, um, this is our sole vocation. So we're making a living on this farm. So we have to use some commercial agricultural production techniques, which is similar to the way vegetable farmers uh, row crop for efficiency standpoint. But we're also incorporating a lot of uh, permaculture um, planting smaller scale into our overall layout and we're trying to expand on that. We're using soil conservation practices and we're even experimenting with some no-till methods and we're having great success. We're very diverse. We have over 60 species that we grow here on our farm. About 50 of them are for commercial sales and the other 10 are for um, live nursery plant sales and that's not even mentioning all the, all the wild plants that were already here on the land and all the trees and shrubs that we've planted both for both food and wildlife and for wood. We're a diverse farm growing mainly perennials. Fortunately, most of the medicinal herbs that we grow are perennials. So we have that, that benefit of having being able to use a lot more permaculture methods in our planting. So it's a small-scale diverse farm that feels really big to Melanie and I at times. <laughs> <Sure does. laughs> oh, and it sounds like a gorgeous, like you said, a sanctuary for plants and wildlife. And can you, just to, to start off, um, can you tell our listeners, when we're talking about growing medicinal herbs, what type of plants are we talking about, just for those who may not know? Well, we're not, we're not growing medicinal marijuana, and sometimes that's something that people um, get confused about because especially in certain states, there's a, a strong movement for for that type of agriculture. We have um, perennial herbs, like Jeff mentioned, but things like echinacea, peppermint, lemon balm, um, golden seal, black cohosh, tulsi, um, chamomile, some that are very familiar to people, but some that are also up and coming, like ashwagandha, um, ginkgo, gota cola. So we have quite a variety, and we try to um, look for plants that are highly desired in the marketplace and for people that are making their um, their local medicines, but also looking at the different body systems and, and making sure that we have the herbs that can support wellness on all different fronts that someone might be interested in. Oh, that's great. And Melanie, you are an herbalist, community herbalist. Do you think it's necessary for an aspiring herb farmer to be an herbalist? 
you know, we have lots of debate about this, and I and I think to be a, an herb farmer, you don't necessarily need to be a trained clinical herbalist. I think that um, what's important is, you know, understanding the life cycle of the plants, understanding what they're used for in a general sense so that you can help your consumer and your customers understand how those two things, the life cycle and the, the potency of the medicine, go hand in hand because it's really important to harvest plants at their most vital and full of all the medicinal properties that you're wanting to utilize. So having that knowledge is really important, but we don't do clinical work here. We don't see patients. We don't um, talk to people about like health protocols because that in and of itself is a science and an art, and um, we don't have the time or the training in that way to do that well. So we, we mainly focus on the growing of the herbs and understanding how to harvest it at its most potent and getting that, um, that medicinal product to the companies and to the individuals that we're selling to. Um, that said, if you are an herbalist, most herbalists love to be outside and growing. So I think there's room for both. Like it's not a requirement, but it's absolutely a wonderful augmentation and a partnership if you um, are studying herbal medicine and the clinical piece to also understand how they grow and how the plants like to thrive out in nature and where their ecosystems are. And it's really empowering to be able to identify an herb from seed all the way up until you're putting it in a tincture bottle or in a, in a tea form. So I think there's room for both, but it's not necessarily for your listeners. If you're not an herbalist, you can still grow medicinal <laughs> plants and do really well. <laughs> you won't get kicked off your farm. No. <laughs> you won't. No, absolutely not. And we're trying to really um, reach out to people that are pre-existing farmers, whether they're you know, dairy farmers, vegetable farmers, you know, already out there doing the work, there's a way to diversify their crops by adding a few of the medicinal herbs to augment and to strengthen um, their, their own business plans and their farm plans. So definitely reaching out to that population as well. You um, seem like a great team because, Jeff, you, your background and your families were farmers. And it sounds like you have a lot of experience with farming. And then, Melanie, you have the herbalist side and the business side. So what an ideal partnership. We got very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is um, pretty interesting to, to consider that when I was young and I visited the family farms, I, I was really in love with that lifestyle and, you know, loved the tractors and the cows and the rolling hills and the whole, the whole idea of it. But m many people in my family who had moved away from the farm for um, different economic choices and a, maybe an easier way to make a living sort of instilled in me that that was not the best career choice to be made, as interesting as it was. And I, and I listened, and for a long time I, I moved away from the farm and I tried some other things, but I always felt like there was, there was a draw and when I met Melanie and uh, Rosemary Gladstar, Melanie's mom, and was introduced to this world of, of herbs and he, that, that plants could heal us and others and animals, and um, it just was a perfect marriage. And it's, uh, it's just it's really amazing how we've brought Melanie's background with herbalism and running an herbal product business and my you know, passion and interest in agriculture and, and really capitalize on both of our strengths. And um, we work really, really well together. I'm not saying it's always perfect, but as far as <laughs> married couples owning a business together, it's all, it's, it works really well. Mm -hmm. Our strengths and weaknesses balance each other out really, really well. It's pretty amazing. So for people saying, okay, you're growing medicinal herbs, I've heard of some of those herbs, what are some of the main differences between growing culinary herbs and maybe vegetables? And you could do them separately if you want, but and medicinals, like what are some of the differences in growing these plants? Well, it's interesting. We had a, a, a one of those um, great farm, moment, farm moments and um, with some of our um, employees last season, a couple seasons ago maybe, and um, one of them had worked extensively as a vegetable farmer and a manager of crew and doing that kind of work. And she is out in the peppermint fields with us, and she was waxing poetic saying how much she loves um, working with medicinal herbs because the pace is very different. And I don't come from a vegetable farming background, so I asked her, I was like, well, could you tell me more about that? And she was speaking about how with vegetable farming, there most of them are annuals, and the, the intensity of trying to get fresh produce to market is extremely um, hardcore, and that's a primary focus. Whereas with um, medicinal herbs, like Jeff was saying, you know, 80% of our crops are um, perennial, and so you develop a life cycle understanding. You have a longer time where you get to develop relationships, and also for marketability, being able to stagger crop 
harvest and also we dehydrate our medicinal herbs. So we have, we bring herbs into stock and carry them over the winter so that we are able to be selling plants to people year round. And so there is that like a paradigm difference there between, you know, the intense annual vegetable farmer, very hybridized and specialized plants in that way and growing, you know, perennial wild plants uh, that are medicine and how we work with them is quite different. And I'm sure Jeff can add a little bit to that, but those are some of the key things for me that I had to like kind of appreciate that there's beauty in both, but it's actually wonderful to be able to have these winter crops that, you know, store well and are able to be taken through the winter. So I think for diversifying for vegetable farmers, there's a real nice dovetailing that could happen for sure. Yeah, we have, uh, we have several friends who are vegetable farmers and they're, they're doing very well on their, you know, it's always interesting to compare notes on our different techniques and things. And, um, you know, a common thread with the vegetable farmers, a common challenge is the insect and disease pressure. And the the difference between the crops that we're growing and the crops that they're growing is primar- primarily, as Melanie mentioned, most of the vegetables are hybrids and they are uh, grown as annuals. And so most of the plants that we're growing are virtually relatively unchanged from their original natural state. They're wild plants and they have been selected some and bred some, but they're naturally very resistant to insect and disease pressure. So we have a lot more time to spend tending the plants and planting and harvesting them without um, battling uh, insects. We have a more plant positive approach than a pest or disease negative approach, which is a lot easier to manage. And as Melanie mentioned, we have the added benefit of being able to dehydrate our crops and storm for a regular, uh, relatively long period of time, whereas the vegetable farmers, as Mel mentioned, they have, there's that race to get it from, from basically from, from harvest to table before perishability comes in you know, and spoils the party. So we feel really fortunate that, we're, that we have a lot more flexibility in our cropping and that um, we're growing plants that, at least from an ecological standpoint, are, you know, make a lot more sense and are just more sustainable in the big picture. One thing that's interesting, too, for, like, similarities for vegetable farming and um, medicinal herb farming is some of the equipment is the same. And, like, I love to do lots of things by hand, but it was over the course of multiple years and maybe as I aged and got wiser and, you know, where Jeff has a lot more understanding of the um, the tractors and the mechanical piece of it, he started tricking out a lot of the equipment that you use on a vegetable farm with just some really ingenious, simple changes and modifications and able to make those equipment that equipment be able to work for helping us um, do medicinal herb farming. So that was something that was really helpful. It's like we didn't have to have completely specialized equipment that's just medicinal herbs. It was like transplanters and water wheels and, you know, potato diggers that can dig burdock root. You know, there's things that are really um, can cross into both both realms, and that was really great. So after I put down the shovel and was like, oh, I'll try this <laughs> new equipment, it was I, I, I was hollering for joy when I saw those burdock roots just popping out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I can relate. My friend and friends and I worked at an organic heirloom nursery years ago, year many years ago, 15 years ago. And I remember being out in the hot sun with a hat on that there were all these little black flies that would fly in your face. And the yeah. hat had little dangly things that were supposed to keep them out and digging <laughs> trenches in the hot sun. I thought there yeah. has to be a better way. <laughs> has to be. <laughs> there always is. Yeah. Or usually there is. Yeah. <laughs> you hope. Um, so yeah. one thing that I, reading your book, I really started thinking about some of the herb, my herb friends and herbs that I love, and it seems like many of them tend to grow in disturbed soils with little fertility. So I'm wondering, how do you provide th- these herbs with the conditions to thrive? And I could see how permaculture principles would come in through working with nature and observing the plants in their natural habitat. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that's a great point. Some of the most pl- potent plants that we as herbalists find are those that are harvested from the wild. There, there are several reasons why we can't continue to harvest these plants for the wild. Um, first of all, there's, there's the ecological aspect of over-harvesting, and so we're encouraging people to cultivate instead of harvesting these plants from the wild, especially those that are threatened. The other aspect is that or what we're trying to do is basically mimic the environments that we see these plants growing in the wild so that they continue to produce these the potent um, phyto, phytomedicinal compounds that we seek as users of herbal medicine. And so uh, it's not always easy. As I mentioned, we're, we're row cropping with traditional row cropping methods in fields 
we, you know, generally like to promote fertile soils, and that's a good thing. We add a lot of organic matter to our soils, but there are some crops that, some medicinal plants that don't do well in that. They may they may grow big and lush and green, but in so doing, there's oftentimes a compromise of the of the concentration of of medicinal compounds. So we have um, found ways to sort of adapt our um, sort of the inputs that we're putting into our soil. And some of the plants that like a poorer soil, arnica, for example, rhodiola is another one. We'll put in you know some of our poor poorer soils on our farm, which are not not too difficult to find, and other plants that. <laughs> Really like the, you know, the plants that we see growing in, uh, you know, behind old barns and the old manure pile, things like stinging nettle and the milky oats that like a more fertile soil will we'll add more compost to those soils. So we're really trying to, as I mentioned, mimic what we see the plants growing well in the wild. And, and with our diverse land base that we have, we have lots of different types of land on our land, um, anything from wetlands to really dry, well-drained soils with, with gravelly loam, um, we're, we're able to diversify pretty well with our, um, with our fertility. And, you know, again, there's a lot of plants that prefer to grow in the shade in the woodland environment, the woodland plants. And so we have, we have a woodland planting. We're using agro, agroforestry methods to grow plants like ginseng, black cohosh, golden seal, bloodroot, Solomon seal. Many of those plants are threatened in their native environment. So, by cultivating them, we're, pri- we're providing uh, cultivated alternatives, which is a good thing, and we encourage others to do that. And then other plants that like to grow in the hot sun, some of the plants that you would think of you know, growing well in more of a, like a Mediterranean-style climate, things like rosemary, um, pine, lemon balm, for example, we're growing those out in the, in the full sun in marginally fertile soils and withholding water when we can, not irrigating them, especially closer to harvest when we want them to really ramp up their essential oil production. So we're looking at nature for guidance, and we feel like we're, we're achieving success by that. So you're not force-feeding the rosemary with tons of water going, you must grow. <laughs> I could see you. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we and, stress them out because when you stress out the plants, they tend to make those um, secondary compounds that are the things that really make them strong medicine. And like Jeff was saying, we also select when we see robust plants that are doing just like, you know, super well in our environment we'll collect seeds from them like we had one time where skullcap was you know doing great and then it like got nailed by powdery mildew and we selected from those plants so that we now have some strands that are really strong and grow well here and are resistant to that so it's just it's always being a student of nature i liked when jeff mentioned that it's like looking at what nature does well mimicking it and then um, trying to just help it along for sure yeah, and I loved your skull cap story. I love skull cap, by the way. That's one of my favorite herbs. And um, Great plant. yeah, isn't it? It's one people don't know. I think it's the name kind of yeah. puts people off. It needs a new name. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the skull park. No, but um, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, but that plant. I loved your story about because that plant likes, which I learned in your book, likes to grow on the margins, on the edge between ecosystems. Can you share your story about that a little bit more in depth? How you learned how to grow skull cap in a more effective way. Sure. Well, as Melanie mentioned, we uh, in the beginning we grew skullcap according to what we basically read on the back of the seed packet, or maybe in one of the seed catalogs, which is that it likes to grow in fertile soil in the full sun. And so that's what we did. The first year we grew it, it did pretty well. We had a kind of relatively rainy, rainy, cloudy summer. Um, the following year, it was really dry, really sunny, and really humid. And we gr- growing the plant out in the full sun was not a good idea because it became really susceptible to powdery mildew. We planted a big, pretty big crop from our, from our standpoint of skullcap for a particular wholesale order. It was about a, I think it was about a half an acre of skullcap. And uh, it was doing well, and we went away for a week vacation in late July, and the skullcap was doing well. We were going to harvest it. When we came back, it was just starting to flower, and we came back, and we went out to harvest it, and the whole field was infested with powdery mildew. And uh, what we saw started seeing was that when we saw skullcap growing in the wild, which is it's not very common, but we would see it from time to time, it was commonly growing um, in what is referred to as the ecotone, which is the edge of where the, you know, where the forest meets the field, for example, so in, in the wild. And it was always, where we saw it, it was thriving in that environment. And what we realized is it oftentimes was growing in fertile soils that were, you know, high in organic matter, but not 
high in nitrogen, and also that it had protection from the afternoon sun. And so it liked, it preferred what, from our standpoint, it seemed to prefer not full sun, but more like partial shade or partial sun, if you will. And so we, we mimicked that. We planted the skullcap in the following year on the eastern side of a hedgerow, so it was getting, getting protection from the hot afternoon sun, you know, going down in the west. Planted it in soils that were higher in organic matter, but with not a lot of available nitrogen, and, and the plants did really well. And we're trying to we're trying to follow that procedure from year to year. And now we're growing really good, healthy skullcap that's more resistant to powdery mildew. And as Melanie mentioned, we're selecting from plants that have shown resistance to that. So that's uh, that's one of our you know success stories. And one of the things that we've done now, because we have to row crop, you know, and for efficiency's sake, is we have skull caps planted right next to blue vervain, and blue vervain grows very, very tall, and skull, like, almost, you know, five to six feet tall at times, and so then it's right next to the skull cap, and so it provides shade, so it's able to be grown in the, quote, full sun in the field, but because of the companion planting, it's also getting the, what it needs in that, um, in that shade you know, that shade from the plant, which is great. That leads into a question I had about, you mentioned food forest layers in the book. And can you tell us what a typical medicinal herb guild would look like? Sure, yeah. Well, we have uh, we have some guilds going here close to our home that we're experimenting with and really, really watching. So one example that I'm sort of looking at right now is black locust trees. And underneath the black locust tree, which is the overstory, would be uh, a black cohosh plant. And underneath the black cohosh plant, there are some, well, there's some red clover planted around it. And then there's some nettle plants and there's some burdock roots coming up. And so we're, we're taking advantage of the layers that, again, mimicking what we see in nature to adapt our methods to include more permaculture methods. And this is hard to do on from a commercial standpoint because as a whole, the yields tend to be smaller. But we are, uh, as I mentioned, continually experimenting with this so we can try to expand on it and take advantage of a, of, of a more true permaculture method because what we're using now with a lot of our perennials that are in the field, you know, they're in the field for three or four or five years. Nettles, for example, will, har- will harvest two or three times a season. And you would think that nettles would live for 12 or 15 or 20 years in the wild, and they do when they're not being harvested two or three times a year. So we have to move even the perennial plants around um, from time to time every three or four or five years. So we're trying to establish more permanent agriculture in some of these guilds. And, and as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's experimental at this point, but so far the experiment is working. And you mentioned earlier harvesting the plants when they're at the peak of their secondary metabolites, the chemical constituents are the highest. One question I had was, how can you tell? Is this just from experience? Well, some of it is passed on from tradition in the, in the herbal tradition that, you know, humans have evolved with plants and they've been using the plants for, for millennia. And so they, the body of research, you know, even though it's anthropological research, they've been seeing that the plants have these metabolites at certain times, whether it's at the beginning of the season, like for spring and fall for roots, when the plant is either um, has all of its carbohydrates and nutrients in the root before green growth grows on, or at the end of the season when everything is channeling itself back to the roots and for storage. So some of it, I think, has been from observation, from use, for seeing when the plant's medicine is the strongest, just from trying it, saying, like, I'm going to make, you know, this medicine over time and see what happens and how it goes. And, and that's been passed on in the herbal tradition, you know, through folkloric tradition, through peoples all over the world for, for decades, centuries, millennia. But now there's also an amazing body of science knowledge that has come out, scientific knowledge, because there's a lot of testing that happens with plants now um, for chemical constituents and markers and um, companies wanting to know, you know what, what's contained in the medicine that they're buying. And so what's really beautiful is that with good growing techniques and good harvesting techniques, um, the science is valid validating what the people have known forever. <laughs> and that's really <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> like that, that is really affirming. And it's also, you know, people learn and understand things in different ways. So some people will be just absolutely fine with the folkloric method and, and hearing that this is when the best time is to harvest lobelia when it's in seed pod or right after flowering. Or, and they're fine with someone just saying that this is how we've always done it and it's folkloric and it's great. Other people feel more validated and comfortable with the scientific body of knowledge. And so um, that can be really useful. 
And I think using both techniques is really helpful. But a lot of times it's just really observation of when the plant's at its most vital, when the energy of the plant is um, just, you know, at its pristine, it's clean, it's, um, you know, whether it's in bloom, when you're trying to do blossoms, they're fat and open and, you know, reaching for the sun. Or, you know, like we were talking about with root crops and leaf crops, they all have different um, signatures of time when they like to be harvested. And, and that's where your question about do you need to be an herbalist, not necessarily, but you do need to know this piece. This is the piece that's absolutely critical because you need your medicine to be um, its most potent. Because you want to harvest the right part. And the right part, and there's techniques for that, and you want to make sure that it's like, and some things, for example, valerian is a prime example. If you read a general rule of thumb is to harvest your roots in the spring or the fall because that's when the nutrients and all of the different metabolites and things that are needed in the plant medicine are in the roots, and that makes perfectly good sense. And so you go out in the, the fall, and that's when you harvest them, and you're like, wow, like that, those roots are kind of tiny. Like, wow, they, they might be really full of strong medicine, but there's not a huge yield. And so then if you dig them in the spring, you're like, wow, they're amazing because now they look like fat spaghetti rather than these little spindly things. And um, they also are highly medicinal. So looking at those two observations, I, we always dig our valerian in the spring because of that. The general rule is spring or fall, but we have found that the biggest yield and the highest medicine content is in the spring. So you get that anecdotal understanding and trial and error or sharing in your communities about what's working for farmers and harvesters, and then you put that um, you know, in your own notes as a farmer and you say, this is when we're going to harvest. So there's lots of rules of thumb, but there's definitely some, um, some specificity by species for sure. And I just have to know, harvesting the valerian, does it smell like, does it have that valerian <laughs> smell? Is it the dirty sock? smell. <laughs> no, no, see, this is it's a poor valerian. Yeah. I feel for valerian. You know, I think that fresh dug valerian smells like sweet violets. I really oh, do. I love that. And they it smells this, beautiful. It smells beautiful and smells earthy and it's lovely. And then, you know, as it dries, that change in aroma will sometimes happen. But And it does sometimes smell like, you know, a little funky. But the dirty sock has never been my my moniker for it. <laughs> I know. You know, I'll take, sometimes if I can't sleep, I'll get out my skull cap and my valerian. And I think the skull cap's just easier for me to take and I don't know my valerian that I buy in the tincture isn't my favorite smell but no it's yeah. not the <laughs> but fresh valerian <laughs> smells very different than the dried or tincture for sure so um we'll, have, we'll get you out to the farm and you can dig some with us <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I know we love you, Valerian. It's just yes, we more sure pungent. Do. Yeah. And so, Jeff, is there any, or and Melanie, is there anything else you want to add about growing the plant, growing the medicinal herbs um, before we move on to? I wanted to talk a bit about processing. Yeah. Well, as far as growing the plants, a lot of people, as I mentioned, we've been doing this for 15 or so years, and a lot of people that are relatively new uh, to this, you know, to this vocation, but are interested in it. I seem to have an opinion that these plants that we're growing are difficult to grow. In my opinion, that's a myth because most of these plants are, in, again, from my perspective, relatively easy to grow. That doesn't mean that it's not challenging to farm them commercially. But as I mentioned, most of these plants are plants that are growing in the wild, and um, they're very adaptable, and they're relatively free from pest and disease pressure. You know, they're open-pollinated. They're relatively easy to start from seed. So the plants are easier to grow, I would think, than a lot of ornamental and edible plants that are, people are more familiar with. So, so I just like to put that out there, that yes, you can grow medicine. It's not hard. There are some plants that are harder to grow, but most of them are relatively easy from just a growing standpoint. And I also would say, um, you know, it's really um, empowering to grow like many varieties and then certain plants will find an affinity not only for the land and the ecosystems, but also for you as the grower. So I think, I think that's really great for people to try out a bunch of different things and see what happens to take in their land and like really go for that. We, we do a lot of consultations for farmers and we give them like the top 10 list or the, you know, 20 herbs that need to be grown, you know, by farmers all over the country. But then there's also ones that you're just going to fall madly in love with and you won't mind doing the 10 hours of extra labor because you want that plant in your community on your land. And, um, and that will make this really potent, amazing medicine. So we have some plants that <laughs> we grow no matter what because we absolutely adore them. And um, then also ones that just grow here that we're like, wow, right on. We didn't know if it would make it, but it has done 
super well, like ashwagandha. I mean, that's a plant from India. <laughs> Vermont is so different than the climate <laughs> in India. <laughs> but that plant loves it here, and we have had amazing success with it. And if we had just gone by literature alone and not tried it, we might have said, yeah, that won't do so well in, you know, rainy Lamoille County, Vermont. <laughs> but it does really well. <laughs> and people, people are... People are becoming increasingly empowered, you know, with with self healing and being able being able to heal themselves and taking a more preventative pro- approach to healthcare. And I think the the best way that people can do that is also um, establishing a relationship with the medicine they're they're using, which is very different than the traditional relationship of going to seek assistance from a physician and being prescribed something that comes in a container that you pick up at the, the at the pharmacy. So. Growing uh, a medicinal plant from seed, and as Melanie mentioned, following that plant through its life cycle, establishing a relationship with it, whatever form that takes. Um, for me, I, I definitely communicate with the plants, and I, and although they don't speak English, and I, I don't talk to the plants, <laughs> there's, 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 a, there's a knowledge there, and anyone who's spent enough time with plants, I'm sure, would, would agree with me that there's a form of empowerment that takes place when you can not only start your medicine from seed and follow it during its life cycle, but harvest it with good intention, make your own medicine, and just think about that while you're taking that medicine. Um, it really potentizes the medicine, and it's just part of the overall picture of, of self-empowerment through healing with plant medicine, which is incredible. I can see that's a much more powerful. Um, it, it gives you that personal relationship with the medicine you're taking into your body. Absolutely. It just potentizes it. Mm-hmm. And Melanie, you mentioned um, some of, I think, your top 10 herbs to grow, that there's a market for these herbs and we need to grow them. Would you like to share some of those with our listeners? Sure. Um, and Jeff, feel free to add on. Um, okay. We always we always put out there the nettle, the oats, the lemon balm, the mints. Like Those are ones that, from a, um, an ease of growing and also demand, it's definitely herbs that should be being grown. Things like golden seal, black cohosh, and some of the other woodland plants, high demand and also needs to be grown because they're being over-harvested in um, their natural environments and they are either at risk or to watch for um, being over-harvested and they're on the United Plant Savers at-risk list. So those are some. We also have ones that like Tulsi is one that should be people should be trying to grow because there's a high demand and it's also a wonderful adaptogenic herb. It's in the you know, it's a basil and it's absolutely fantastic and you know uplifting to grow. So those are the ones that we put out there. And when we are we are looking at a plant and saying, you know, is this one that I should try? Looking at marketability, looking at how well it grows in your environment, ease of drying and processing. And also um, the looking at what you're doing for the plant populations in general. Those are some of the lenses that we use when we look at that. And um, we have had really good success with all of those plants and also finding uh, markets for local, you know, in our community in Vermont, but then also at the New England regions and also in nationally we've had good success with that as well so and i think from a from a marketability standpoint we're seeing incredible sales and 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 the big picture too the overall herb market especially in the adaptogens the adaptogenic tonics and the nervines go figure we're stressed out and we need to <laughs> we need uh, plants to help us adapt to environmental physical emotional stress so as Mel- melanie mentioned tulsi um ashwagandha siberian ginseng are, are the premier adaptogens that that we're growing and marketing, and the nervines, you know, milky oats, and blue vervain, skullcap, um, lemon balm are all relatively easy to grow and very marketable and um, important plants to help us uh, through these crazy times. I just wanted to add a couple more plants because, I mean, we give you a laundry list. But I also think because there are a lot of herbs out on the mass market and, you know, people have are so lucky that we can pull from all over the world and bring plants in. But there's also something that's so magical and wonderful about local medicine and um, the quality is so much better when you do it yourself. So blossoms are things that if people are trying to break into herb markets, nobody has more beautiful mark, um, more beautiful crops of blossoms than those that are picked by hand in small bags and dried really carefully. So things like calendula, 
roses, chamomile. We've had some experiences with chamomile where you know people will get it off the mass market for like twelve dollars a pound, and they'll see our price and they'll be all alarmed at like, wow, why is it so expensive? And then they look at our chamomile and they're like, this is incredible stuff. This smells divine. This is absolutely beautiful. So I think from an herb growers, you know, if your listeners are thinking about how could I do something that was like kind of more value added and you know kind of this artisanal tea grade blossoms are a really great way to go. And blossoms sell them. Themselves. I think sometimes people buy blossoms. They don't even know what they're used for yet, but they're like, I just need that orange calendula. Never seen it before, but I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, they'll call us. They'll, they'll get home with a package and they'll call us and they'll be like, okay, so I bought this calendula and now, now what do I do with it? Because I just wanted to have that orange. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. It's the gateway herb. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And I read too, um, in the book that you said that the, and you may have mentioned this today, but that the dried plant should look, taste, smell like the fresh. This is one of the first and most important things we learned from Rosemary Gladstar. And it's so true. And it makes sense because a lot of the stuff that, that we see on the mass market looks more like something you might like use as um, an, animal bedding or animal feed. You know, it looks a little more like hay than it does the original plant it came from. So our primary goal is to retain as much quality in the original plants as we can when we're post harvest when we're you know harvesting them, dehydrating them, post harvest processing them, and sending them out to the masses. And we feel like we're like we've reached that goal. And again, as Melanie mentioned, like people, you know, there's a choice. You can spend a little or quite a bit less money buying something from the mass market that was produced on a huge farm, harvested by you know machinery or people who are not treated well, laborers who are not treated well and paid well, or you can pay some more some more money, quite a bit more oftentimes, and buy something from your local small certified organic medicinal herb farmer who's, who's paying very close attention to quality, primarily quality and secondarily the, bo- the bottom line. Oftentimes, you know, if you pay $12 for one thing from the mass market and you see that it's $36 from the artisanal herb producer, you're going to find that there's three times as much medicine in the $36 variety. And so when you look at it from a quantitative standpoint, it's it's definitely worth it. And people are becoming increasingly well-educated as the importance of quality and making choices based more on quality than cost in, in our experience. And that leads me to the question, like this burgeoning, um, a herb market, the market for medicinal herbs is really growing. And that's exciting and great. But there are also some pitfalls and challenges to that. Could you speak a bit to that? I think that um, one of the things there are, there's so much available now, like if you were here, you know, in the United States, you know, 80 years ago, finding a, a tincture of echinacea would be, you'd be more hard pressed. And now you can go into almost any um, grocery store or a GNC or different places and see a lot of different herbal products and not everything is created equally for sure and um, there's a lot of um, discussion now about quality quantity of herb within a product whether it's been identified botanically as being the correct species and so there's a lot of that happening in the herbal industry and it's a really charged robust important conversation to have and there are many stakeholders but when you distill it down I think the most important thing is knowing where your medicine comes from and knowing who's growing it and knowing who's making it and if you can make it yourself more power to you you know and I think that that is like reclaiming our right it's folkloric um, traditional herbalism was the herb, herbalism and the medicine of the people and so I think that as people we have to be number one really aware of what we're putting in our body and be good consumers and so asking the questions about like what is in this tincture understanding and making a phone call if you work with you know people that are producing products for you or you're buying it off the shelf take that time to really investigate you know the mission and vision of that company and what their quality standards are and how what is their relationship to the farmers or the distributors or the, the practitioners that they're working with and I think that that's really important and um, there's a lot of standards out there the you know good manufacturing you know practices and and that's good and that's really helpful for some people and um, but it's also it's it's wrought with difficulties as well because it's hard sometimes to measure all of the things that make something great and being able to have a conversation and walk into a field or to go and look at someone's drawing techniques and be able to hold the herbs. I think that's really important and empowering. So 
I would encourage listeners to have that conversation with their the people that they're buying their herbs from, but also from the people that are making their medicines and to really try to bring it back to the local movement because that's where it's at. What else do you need besides, so you have, um, you need your land to grow the herbs, you need facilities, processing rooms, drying sheds. Could you share a bit with our listeners about what is necessary to have a productive and successful um, medicinal herb farm? I want to weigh in just about the facilities piece because I think that one of the things that happens, and it's, it happens to me, especially when I'm with people that I'm just so inspired by, like out in the industry and like on big farms or, you know, amazing companies that have done like gone almost public, they're so large. And you look at what they're doing and you're like, wow, that's so inspiring, but how do they get there and how could I even begin? And so... I think that there's a lot you can do with just hand tools and making a small drying facility on your land. It does not have to be grandiose. Like you can, we did for years. I mean, there's pictures in our book of we have plastic stapled to the side of our garage with laughing <laughs> and screens, and we dried so much herb in that, and like with a, like with some shade cloth over. Like you can't imagine how many pounds of herbs came out of that for this very simple structure. There are some things, and I'll let Jeff speak to him because he's very eloquent about it. But like some components that have to be in all good drying facilities. But you don't need like a huge, you know, box car. You don't need to have the most enormous greenhouse that you've now converted in. You can start small and do really well. And then as you scale up and you have all those discussions about economy of scale, there are things that, you know, if you're going to be a major producer that you need to put in place. But I also want to encourage people to to start. Like you don't need to have everything in place. And you can just staple plastic to your your garage, <laughs> put some shade cloth up, and put a lot of fans going. So um, Jeff, if you want to speak to some of the components that people should definitely have in their drying facilities. I think that's helpful conceptually to have, but it doesn't have to necessarily look a certain way. And we beg, borrow, and steal and recycle everything on our farm. So um, you can do a lot with a little for sure. Sure. Well, first of all, I should mention that not all not all herb farms need to dehydrate herbs. So there's, there is the fresh market, and that's something that, um, that we sell too. We sell fresh herbs that are harvested at their peak of potency and chilled to, to remove field heat from the crops and then shipped usually overnight and oftentimes with ice packs nestled in the um, the fresh herbs to ensure their you know their um, stability and shipment and a lot of uh, or I shouldn't say a lot many medicinal herb product manufacturers are using fresh herbs in some of their if not all of their products so there's that market so you don't necessarily have to have dehydration facilities, but for those that are considering using de- uh, dehydrating herbs, what we found is that the most economical and um, easiest choice for the small scale de- for small scale dehydration facilities is is the good old fashioned greenhouse or hoop house, and that's what we're using. They're they're inexpensive, they're easy to build and maintain, and they make ideal um, drying facilities because you can. We are using shade cloth over the greenhouses to protect the herbs from ultraviolet light, which can degrade the the medicinal c- components. But we use like an 80 to 85 percent shade cloth, which does o- still allow some solar gain. So there's still some some heating going on even through the shade cloth inside the greenhouses that are retrofitted to be drying sheds. We have layers of racks that are made very inexpensively with what some people call strapping, other people call lap. It's basically like a one inch by two inch board that is, um, again, inexpensive. And we're stapling screening onto those boards and we're using nylon or fiberglass screening. And a lot of people ask us, well, isn't there a more ecologically friendly material? And we have not found that yet. Aluminum is not a good option. Uh, These are inexpensive facilities with inexpensive drying systems. And inside here in Vermont, because we have uh, lots of rain and lots of humid, wet, dewy nights. We're using supplemental heat from wood-fired furnaces. We have a 25 by 50 drying shed that has a, a wood-fired furnace on either end of it. And we have a, we have a big wood lot, so we're able to sustainably harvest firewood. Other people are using propane and other forms of heat to heat their drying sheds. But the supplemental heat really helps to um, be able to turn the crops over faster. We don't want stuff sitting out in the drying shed and exposed to the elements for too long because the medicinal compounds can can volatize and degrade so we're drying fast but again these 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 facilities do not need to be elaborate they can be simple but effective and there uh, there's a lot more information given in our book the organic medicinal herb farmer on how some of these facilities can be built and used 
Yeah, it's a great guidebook. It's a how-to, and it also delves deeply into the business plan and the business side of farming, which people tend not to think about so much when they're dreaming about their wonderful herb farm. <laughs> they don't tell you. know, I used to yeah. get so discouraged. Everyone wants to tour the farm and see the calendula. Nobody wanted to see my spreadsheet. <laughs> I was like, oh, come on. These are wonderful. But you need to you decorate need them. Both. Decorate That's them right. with pictures of herbs. That's yeah, right. I, I, got, I get into farming, you know, for a number of reasons, but one of the primary re- reasons was so I didn't have to have, you know, a job where I had to sit and stare at a computer. Well, as it turns out, I do have to spend lots of hours sitting and staring at a computer, and that's part of just being a good business owner is you have to understand not only the what's going on outside, but what's going on inside as well, and that's that's really important, especially for those of us who are really trying to make a living doing what we're doing. So we're always... Uh, you know, trying to find the balance between the outer and the inner world and having to personally face my inner demons at times by sitting inside <laughs> staring at the computer for hours and hours and hours. But it also has made us smarter farmers. I mean, one of the things that um, we have done um, in the last few years is really looking at cost of production of crops. And so, you know, we have our spiritual connection to the plants, our just love affair with the green world. And that is, you know, the the bedrock of our lives, but then there's also the need to, you know, make this a viable living for our family. And so one of the things we've done is try to marry the two and looking at what is good farming, farming smarter, not just harder, and keeping, you know, input data of what's going into a crop. And then from that input, you can also start finding efficiencies and capturing those efficiencies so that you can replicate that year to year. Um, and then also share it with our farming community because there aren't huge databases available for how to grow things or like how how do you do an acre of burdock or, or chamomile. Like there's not easily accessible data. So one of the things we've had to do is to keep that data for the inputs and how much it costs to actually produce it. And then that helps us with the price point for our artisanal herbs. And some people ask us, well, how did you get to this number? You know, we can say, well, this is how, how it works and these are places we can improve on it. And these are places that we really can't can't budge. And that's been really power, empowering as farmers so that it puts a finer point on what we're doing. And it also sometimes helps us when we have to make that hard choice um, of whether to continue forward with the crop or to till it in. For example, um, a few seasons ago, it was like the wettest season in Vermont. Our ashwagandha got completely sodden and like it was very wet and the weed seeds were going out of control in the ashwagandha bed and we had a lot planted and Jeff and I went out there and we looked and you know because we just love ashwagandha we our first instinct was to just we're Vermonters we can do this roll up your sleeves get the crew get the hose and we're going to hand weed because we can't even get the equipment in we're going to save this bed heroic and then we paused and we're like okay that's our first initial response now let's take this other way of looking at farming and look at our input and look at our cost of production spreadsheet and say where where are we at right now in the season and where were we thinking to be by the end with yields and how much we would recoup from that if we spend all this time with our hand weeding we will actually be losing money in a big time way and is that the best use of our farm labor and our energies so as sad as it was we decided to till that under and it was the right the right decision in that moment was for lots of reasons but if we didn't have some of those other data points we may have just gone with our instinctual gut, which wasn't the right one for that particular situation. So I encourage farmers to keep that data. You can do it lots of ways, and there's even all these programs now, but there's, there's really simple ways that you can and capture it, and it really informs your practice. And you can sip your um, skull cap or oat tea as you do the spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, definitely <That's> helps. Right. <laughs> Rose water, <Yeah>. hoi <laughs> Yes, oh, absolutely. That's, that's great. And for beginning aspiring herb farmers listening, the question in your book that I thought was very well said was, what comes first, the market or the herb? What do you do to get started? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, it's a great question. And it's tough. To answer, it's very subjective, but ultimately what it comes down is I think the herb comes first because in order to sell something, you have to demonstrate that you can produce it first. And if you have not grown a single chamomile plant, it's hard to go out and convince your local co-ops and stores and, you know, medicinal herb product manufacturers that you're going to have this awesome crop of chamomile and you know what you're going to be able to charge for it and they're going to want to buy it. They're going to want to see something, and they're going to, going to want to have you demonstrate that, that you can do that before they get in, into a contract with you. That said, it's oftentimes hard to figure out what to grow without having those markets. So the two kind of have to go hand in hand, but ultimately I think starting out small and um, familiarizing yourself with 
the growth and the harvesting and the post-harvest processing of a few medicinals that you think may be marketable or that you have found other people interested in purchasing from you is a good way to start. We always encourage people to start out small, grow from there according to what the market dictates. And for us, we started out on one acre the first year and grew a lot of crops experimentally, grew 60, maybe even 70 species, um, several of which we're not growing anymore because they don't do well here or they're not very marketable. But we produced small amounts of, of 50 or so species that we were able to shop around and demonstrate to people that we could produce high quality medicine and and um, it's really taken off from there and primarily from word of mouth so we started out small and have grown to you know we're still small but it feels big as I mentioned and we're now not able to produce anywhere near what is being demanded from us so we're having to say no and turn away a lot of a lot of potential business, which is a challenge that most businesses would welcome, but it's challenging to say no to people, to, to say, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any more calendula in January of a given year because I've sold it all. So we're forming the Vermont Herb Growers Co-op. We're, per, we're pooling resources with other growers to in, in, in order to attempt to increase the, the production to tr- and, and attempt to, uh, to meet the demand. And we're encouraging others all over the world and especially around here where we live to to join us in our efforts because as you mentioned the the demand for medicinal herb products and bulk medicinal herbs is really exploding and most of what is being used in this country medicinal herbs the, the bulk raw material is being imported from overseas and it's good to support developing nations overseas and we want to continue to support cultures that are making basically a living from producing certain crops, but we also want to, we're an agricultural economy here in in the United States, and we have the technology and the resources and and the labor, and we want to encourage other people to to join us in our efforts to increase the volume of medicinal herbs that are produced here locally and on small scale for local markets. And it will help the wild populations of the plants as well. It sure will, and that's another goal is to try to replenish the medicinals that are um, being you know, over-harvested from the wild and the medicinals that are being compromised from habitat loss from development and other issues. And one thing, I'll just piggyback on what Jeff said about, like, starting small and and getting your your herbs out there and then that might lead to more markets. I think that reading good journals and keeping, you know, tabs on what's going on in the marketplace is important, but also being out in your farmer's markets. Like, that's where we started. We brought our herbs um, to farmers market every week, and that got us out in our community. It got people seeing them. It provided that face-to-face time for, for um, conversation. And now, with all of the different platforms that are out there, with Facebook and you know Instagram, there's ways to get your stuff out there for people to see it and interact with it. So we didn't have some of those platforms when we were starting out, but now it's like amazing how many people say, oh my gosh, I just I follow your Facebook page and I love it. So I would encourage people that are starting out to like get get really good at growing the herbs, know them, have the highest quality. Like that is the absolute most important piece is do not skimp on quality because that's your that's your ticket into the into the game and it's also the most important piece. And then just having people be able to see that. And that tends to, the herbs will sell themselves and people will pick up on um, the energetics and the, the efficacy of the plants. And then when what happened for us is we were in that retail face-to-face market with a, like this farmer's market. And then eventually people would put in pre-orders so that they could, we would know going into um, the season that we needed a certain amount. And that really helped to augment when you know, hey, this crop I can sell. It's already got a market and it's going someplace and we could do some contractual growing. So having um, kind of both pieces is important. You can learn all about growing your own medicinal herbs in the Organic Medicinal Herb Farmer, Jeff and Melanie's new book. And how can people find the book and how can they find you online? Um, we have a website zackwoodsherbs.com and then um, we have a Facebook page that um, you can find us at at Zach Woods Herb Farm. Great, so zackwoodsherbs.com. They can order the book through our website at, as Mel mentioned, www.zackwoodsherbs and that's Z-A-C-K Woods, W-O-O-D-S herbs.com. Perfect, thank you. And is there anything I didn't ask you that you would like to share with our listeners? 
Um, I think I think we've covered a lot of it. I would just say that you know, just planting local medicine, planting, supporting local medicine, and planting, you know, the medicine is an important piece. That would be my big takeaway, and just to go for it because that's it's needed, and not to be daunted because the plants really do help support support you in your work. And there's an amazing community out there. So I think that that would be my last thought. <laughs> I echo that last thought. Really encouraging people to grow more medicinal herbs because this country needs more growers. And and there's a viable market, and it's a great way to make a living. Mm-hmm. And we need the medicine. And we need the medicine <laughs> so badly. Yeah. I know. And Jeff and Melanie, if you could close just with sharing one or two, or just one is fine, um, of one of your favorite herbs, and maybe tell our listeners about the medicinal value of the herb. And that will just, I think, whet their appetites to learn more about these wonderful herbs that you're growing. Well, we're going to need a couple more hours because every <laughs> single plant on this farm is, is Melanie's favorite I'm herb. So, so, sure, I so let, let, I'll, I'll start with my favorite herb. <laughs> my favorite herb is Tulsi. I've uh, developed a relationship with this plant. Um, and it not only um, heals me and makes me feel good physically, but emotionally, this is a plant that has become an ally of mine from a spiritual sense. And um, it's um, from a more practical standpoint, it's highly, highly marketable, easy to grow, relatively easy to dry, and incredibly easy to sell. And Tulsi is my favorite plant right now. Mm-hmm. Go yeah, ahead, Mel. Smell oh my that gosh. aroma. You're absolutely right. Been... I have every time we go to a crop, I'm like, this is my favorite plant. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think maybe I have a lot of favorites. But today, my favorites, I have two, especially being in the spring in Vermont, because it is spring today, even though it's May, is um, dandelion. And I just love dandelion and angelica. They are amazing roots. Um, dandelion's leaves, roots, and flowers are all edible. They provide bitters. They're good for the liver. They're tonifying, and they help to really just bring about wellness. And Angelica is a warming bitter that's great to make aperitifs with and um, uh, really stimulates digestion. So I think in this time of getting back into the vital energy of summer, I am all about my roots. Mm. So eating dandelion greens, steaming those up with garlic and onions and um, eating the roots and and making tinctures and um, bitters. That's where we're at. And And all these plants are beautiful in the landscape, especially dandelion. Dandelion, Mm. fields of gold. (laughs) That's what we see. (laughs) Did you hear that, everyone, who is pulling dandelions out of your lawn? No. (laughs) Don't pull them. Eat them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Eat them. And anything you can't eat, you can sell because dandelion is one of the most marketable crops. And so many of our of our more conventional farming neighbors and friends and relatives who have been trying to eradicate eradicate these plants for years are just astounded when they come here and they see that we're growing acres of dandelion and burdock and stinging nettle and <laughs> that, like we're, that we're selling them and making a living <laughs> growing them. It's, uh, I it's love it, yeah. <laughs> I bet you can see the wheels turning in their head like, wait a minute. <laughs> you sure can. Well, well at, at first they laugh. You know, you're you're growing this stuff, and then they oftentimes ask, so, so how much of this are, sh- are you selling? And then how much are you selling it for? And as <laughs> soon as you kind of, like, they start really putting the numbers together, then they're, uh, they're like, running to get in their cars and drive home and order some dandelion feed. <laughs> Sell the cows. Dandelion, you will, you will, you're being exalted right now. It's great. <laughs> yes. Aww. Oh, that's so wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending this hour with me. And again, if you want to learn more, go to ZachWoodsHerbs.com. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Jill. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at SustainableWorldRadio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening.